This is an email. The person didn't tell me whether I could use their name, so I won't. But here's what she writes. I can tell you it's a woman. It's a woman because she has a woman name. In November of 1983, my dad and his friend John decided they wanted both our families to spend Thanksgiving together in the mountains. I was 15 years old that year. My two brothers were 13 and 11, and my sister was only three. The other family, I'll call them the Smiths, had four boys ages 15, 14, 13, and 11. We had rented two cabins, one for each family in Mentone, Alabama, and we all drove up from Birmingham the evening before Thanksgiving Day. I think we're in a state park, but I don't really know for sure. The next day, we all gathered at the family's cabin to cook and hang out together. I remember the sound of football games, so somebody must have had a radio. The cabins didn't have TVs. The dads were smoking a turkey and a goose and some other stuff outside in a smoker they'd brought with them. We ate our Thanksgiving meal around 4.30 as the sun was beginning to set. The meal lasted a few hours, followed by a few more hours of conversation. I think there might have been more football on the radio. Eight o'clock, we began hearing a very loud howl or scream combination just outside the back of the cabin. It had simultaneous high and low pitches and tones within the same scream. It's not a sound a human vocal cord could recreate. Not that any of us thought this could be a human, and the boys all concluded that it was a bear. I knew what bear sounded like from my elementary school days of watching after-school specials and TV shows like Shazam. Shazam! That guy ran into a bear or mountain lion almost every episode. So I also knew what mountain lion sounded like. It must be hurt, I said. That's not what bears usually sound like. Well, what else could it be? One of the Smith boys asked. We all discussed that it didn't sound feline or canine. There were no cougars in Alabama at that time. And since then, the Florida panther has migrated north into Alabama, but probably not that far north. So the only possible feline might have been a bobcat, and their mating calls are pretty loud, but not as loud as this thing was. Coyotes can also make loud sounds, but this didn't sound like a coyote at all. There are no wolves in Alabama. Alabama black bears are really small, 150 to 200 pounds, and this sound was massive. Bears in the Florida panhandle are much bigger, 5 to 600 pounds than Alabama bears, so I would guess bears in South Alabama may be bigger than bears in North Alabama, but at least back then, North Alabama bears, as far as I know, were small. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure even the largest grizzly couldn't have sounded as big as this thing did. It definitely sounded masculine. Even during the high-pitched parts of the scream, it never sounded feminine at all. Some people have described Bigfoot screams as sounding like a woman being murdered. This one never sounded like a woman. It was extremely powerful and I think I remember feeling a vibration, but my memory could be faulty since this was so long ago, and also, I'm just now realizing what this thing most likely was 37 years after the fact, and it's all coming back to me in bits and pieces. The howl, growl, screams continued for an hour with only seconds between each outburst. It sounded like the animal must be just outside the back of the cabin up under the back deck, which was about a story and a half off the ground. The cabin sat on a slope so that the front door was almost level with the road, but the back of the cabin was high off the ground with terrain sloping down toward a creek that ran behind it. The area was densely wooded with total privacy between the cabins, which were positioned 10 yards from each other. And at the end of the road, a city block down the hill from our cabin, was a camping area where there were a few tents set up. I mentioned that I was worried whatever was screaming could be a danger to the campers in the tents. All the boys were saying, oh, they'll be fine. It was like this howl, growl, scream thing was a normal occurrence for campers, nothing to worry about. 
There was a lot of wannabe testosterone in that cabin, I must admit. The thought of it being a Bigfoot would never have occurred to me or any of us. At that time, I had only ever heard of Bigfoot living in the Pacific Northwest. I had seen the Patterson-Gimlin film, but had never seen or heard of the Legend of Boggy Creek movie that came out in 1972, since I would have been only three years old at the time of its release, and nobody I knew ever talked about Bigfoot. Until just a few months ago, I had never heard any Bigfoot stories from Alabama, so the possibility of Bigfoot never crossed our minds. The only thing that came close to making any sense to us was that it must have been a bear. We also heard wood knocks throughout the hour of howl, growl, screaming, but we didn't connect those sounds with the animal. Why would we? In our repertoire of vast knowledge, only a human would hit two pieces of wood together. We assumed the campers were building a fire or something, but that didn't make sense either because the wood knocks were far too loud and far too close to be anything any campers a block away could have been doing. Nothing was adding up, and my brain was all over the place trying to get a grasp of any of it. I don't recall any whoops or whistling, but who knows? Maybe my brain just refused to calculate any more variables that it just couldn't process. At 10 p.m., the Smiths were ready to go back to their cabin. We hadn't heard the howl growl scream for an hour, and no one seemed concerned about going outside, so I assumed it must be safe, or all the adults would be worried. We said goodnight and invited them to come back for leftovers tomorrow. My dad walked outside with them as they left and watched as they walked to their cabin. I guess whatever was out there was either gone or just didn't let his presence known as the six of them walked back through the woods rather than along the road. The next morning, I slept in, and when I woke, nobody was in the cabin, so I took that opportunity to enjoy being alone. I stayed in bed and I read for a while, and then I got up and I ate some leftovers. I figured I'd go for a walk after I ate. I left a note on the kitchen counter that I was going for a hike, and I went out the back door and down the stairs off the deck and then down the hill to a path along the creek. I didn't think about the screaming animal from the night before. I'm sure my mind was too blown to think. So off I went, alone and unarmed. do de do do de do walking along, not a care in the world. Men tone in the fall is beautiful. How could there be any danger here? I saw no wildlife of any kind, not even fish jumping or birds flying. I didn't hear any animal sounds or birds singing. It was weirdly quiet, but it didn't occur to me to be scared or weirded out by that. I was just glad I didn't run into any snakes. I walked along the creek for about an hour, thinking I'd run into members of my family or the Smith family, but I never did. I walked back and stopped by the Smith's cabin to see if they were all there, but I only found the four Smith boys sitting around the radio listening to a football game. I walked up to the road to the general store at the top of the hill to see if I could find my mother and Mrs. Smith but they weren't there either, and there were no other options for where they could be. So I bought a Coke, and I went back to my family's cabin to eat more leftovers. The two moms and my little sister came in while I was making a sandwich, and they joined me for a late lunch. For some reason, we didn't talk about the howl growl screams. We had all just put it out of our minds. After we ate, the moms went to the Smith's cabin, and they left my sister with me. She and I decided to walk up to the store and get something sweet. It was after four o'clock at this point. Twilight was just beginning, but still light enough that I wasn't concerned about it getting too dark before we could get back to the cabin. The general store was only half a city block up the road from the cabin, and I held my sister's hand as we walked slowly up to the store. 
The woods on either side of the dirt road were thick enough that it was really dark in the woods, but the road was not at all dark yet. About halfway to the store, I noticed on the side of the road, just inside the wood line, there was a dark animal three feet high sitting very still and watching us. At the point I noticed it, we were almost parallel with it on the road and less than 10 feet away. My brain processed what I saw as a bear sitting there in the dark because that's what we all decided it had to be. After all that logical analysis the night before, I just went into full-blown cognitive dissonance and had accepted that it was a bear. But recently it occurred to me that I didn't see a snout on its face or ears on the top of its head. I remember knees like a biped would have squatting down. A sitting bear would not have bent knees out front. Also, bears don't sit perfectly still for long periods of time. At the very least, his head would have moved. This thing had to have been watching us, perfectly still, for at least ten minutes before I saw it, because I had not seen or heard any movement at any time during our walk. And if you've ever walked with a three-year-old, you know we were walking very slow. Thinking it was a bear, I calmly and slowly picked up my sister and walked as fast as I could without running. I didn't want it to chase us, and it didn't, thank God. I don't remember a smell. That's the only thing that makes me question whether it was a Bigfoot. But I don't know what else it could have been. I know the shape of what I saw was not a bear, and what I remember could only have been a hairy man squatting down by a tree. When we got to the store, I was winded and panicky, but I didn't want my sister to know there was anything wrong, so I carried on normally. I let her pick out what she wanted to eat, and I got us each something to drink and a candy bar for myself, and after paying, I looked for a place to sit inside the store. I planned to just stay there forever. I was not walking back to that cabin. No way. After trying to entertain a three-year-old for a while after we finished our snacks and drinks, I was thinking about buying us a second round when the moms and one of my brothers walked into the store. I told them that I saw a bear on the side of the road and that I was too scared to walk back. They said they hadn't seen anything and there was nothing to worry about. Take note that by this time it was completely dark outside, and, of course, they didn't see anything. But I felt safety in numbers, so my sister and I walked back with them, and I just didn't think about it. The Smiths came over for dinner that night, and we finished off our Thanksgiving leftovers. Again, At 8 p.m., we heard the same screams for an hour, just like the night before. And again, nobody seemed very concerned about it. I told the boys I'd seen a bear earlier, and it was only three feet tall and it was sitting down. No big deal. But I stayed inside the cabin with my sister all the next day and until we left on Sunday morning. After that, we never went back to Mentone. That's a good little story. That kid was taking care of his little sister, wasn't he? That's what I think that's what I like most about this story. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of 15-year-old kids that would just kind of forget about their 3-year-old sister. But this kid, there's no way, man. He was hanging with his sister and he wasn't going to walk back down that road with a bear on the road or a Bigfoot. Of course, she didn't know it was a Bigfoot at the time. I bet he grew up to be a pretty good man. I bet he's got a family. And I bet he takes a real good care of them. And that's kind of an anecdotal story. And it's one of those mysterious stories that you just don't know. You just don't know, but they make great stories. And so to the writer, I really appreciate it. He wasn't a brother. He was a sister. Oh, I knew it was a woman when I first started reading this. And then all of a sudden my mind shifted to this writer being a man, a boy, but he wasn't a boy. It was a teenage girl. That makes it even cooler. She was protecting her sister. Okay, I'm an idiot. I'm a moron. You guys don't pay attention to me. Let's get on to another story before I destroy this anymore. All right, let's go to another one. 
Hey y'all, my name is Cam Buckner and this is the Dixie Cryptid Channel. I've got four or five stories in this video. I can't remember how many I've recorded, but uh, we've got three or four by me, one by Neoma Finn, who you all have to go check her channel out. Neoma Finn, uh, she's, she's added a suffix to the name of her channel. I'll put a link in the description and I'll run a little card. So if you wanna go check her stuff out, and you should, Click it in the description or look at the card up at the top. But we got those stories and then at the end, we got a letter from Lewis Shanks. Now Lewis is Steve Lilly's neighbor who lives right down the road in the trailer park from Steve. He's written a letter. I've read it, I've narrated it. He wanted me to read it to you all and it's at the end of this video. So I hope you guys will hang around to listen to it because if you're thinking about hunting Bigfoot, you are going to have to, you're going to want to listen to what he has to say. It's very important. All right, enough talking. Let's get rolling. All right, here we go. Here is an email from Tom. And the title of this story is Beef River Tales. Beef is spelled B-O-E-U-F. I think it's in Louisiana. It was late that evening in August 1953 when the phone rang. The caller was one of my mother's sisters calling to tell her that my maternal grandmother had died unexpectedly while visiting friends in Detroit, Michigan. My father was at work at the time and I was sent to bed while my mother and aunt talked. I remember hearing my father come home from work and my parents quietly discussing things. The next thing I knew, it was 4 a.m., and I was being awakened and told to get dressed because we were leaving for my mother's ancestral home in northeast Louisiana near the little town of Oak Grove. I was told that my grandmother's coffin was being shipped by a train to her home on their farm near the Beef River, and the funeral would be in about five days. As I sleepily walked outside to get in our 1951 Studebaker, all was packed and ready to go. We were living in California's Central Valley at the time as my dad worked for an oil company there. All of us being Southerners, we yearned to go back home, but not under these circumstances. Blessed with good luck and no car trouble, we made it to our destination after three days and three nights of continuous driving. And as we drove down the gravel road outside of Oak Grove, a column of dust spread out behind us, and we could see my mother's childhood home up in the distance. It was located well off the road, surrounded by their farmland, and further back by the dark woods. The house was built long before the American Civil War, and it sheltered many generations, some of whom were still there even though they had passed. I never felt comfortable in that old house, especially when it was just me with no other kids around, and at times I felt I was being watched to make sure I was behaving myself. When we pulled into the front drive, we were met and welcomed and hugged by all the family and friends who had been there off and on since the notice of my grandmother's death. We were fed, and we got a chance to clean up and rest after the marathon driving trip we had just completed. We were told that my grandmother's coffin had arrived, and it would be going to the local funeral home first before coming to the family home. After a rest and a good meal, we were told that Grandma was on her way. The hearse could be seen coming down the dusty road a mile away. It pulled into the yard and the funeral director and my grandmother's pastor accompanied the family men as they brought grandma inside and placed her on the buyer and arranged the flowers. The pastor blessed all those present, the house, and he blessed grandma. The funeral director opened the upper section of the coffin over grandma's face and upper torso and placed a finely woven gauze type cloth over that part of the coffin. Then he announced that those who wished could come and see my grandmother, and most people did. Then he took a couple of photos for the family who were not able to come and suggested to the family that due to the time elapsed during the train trip from Michigan 
and the hot August heat that the coffin be sealed and not reopened. Everyone agreed. In the South, there has long been the tradition of sitting up with the dead. The deceased will be placed on a bier in the sitting room or living room surrounded by wreaths of flowers. Family and friends will take turns sitting with the deceased continually from the time the person dies until they are buried. Some of those present then took up the vigil. Once the funeral director had left, the friends, family, and pastor and neighbors who had come to the home to pay their respects and help with the vigil got to visit and tell stories and eat the wonderful foods they each had brought. We kids, mostly cousins I haven't seen in months, got to go outside and play. The mood lightened considerably, just like Grandma would have wanted. After a couple of more days, the funeral director came and took Grandma to Beulah Cemetery, not far from where she lived and where many of her relatives rested. In those days, it was already ancient and quite grown up with vegetation and had to be accessed by going through two cattle pastures and two electric fences. It was maintained by those who had family resting there, and I remember many a day spent there cutting grass and weeding. After the funeral service, Mosh returned to Grandma's home for one last meal and more reminiscing. Goodbyes were said all around, and some of those who had come from greater distances lingered a few days longer. Well, this gave me a chance to play with my cousins a bit more. Anytime we kids would play outside, we would be told to stay away from the woods far across the fields behind the house. They told us the booger man lives in those woods and down on the river. And my mother remembers being told stories of sightings of a strange man-like being often seen in the woods and around Oak Grove, and in particular, a long beef river. Large footprints were sometimes seen in newly plowed fields and on the river banks, and we kids loved to follow my grandfather's tractor when he plowed because he would frequently turn up arrowheads or pottery shards and other neat things. Even then, we were admonished to stay near the tractor and not go near those woods. During the summer, when the corn would grow tall and up near the house, we were told to stay out of the cornfield. There had been folks who said that the man would go into the cornfields for the fresh sweet corn and occasionally vegetable gardens would be entered and farm animals sometimes would come up missing. One story I was told by my grandfather was when he got home from World War I in about 1919, he and my grandmother were living in the house after they got married. One night, my grandmother was sitting at her dresser combing her hair with her back to the bedroom window. People who lived well out in the country at that time didn't usually put curtains on their windows because their nearest neighbor might be a mile away or more. As my grandmother looked in the mirror, she saw a face in the window behind watching her. She said it was large and dark, but since they were still using kerosene lamps, it was not well lit. Grandpa had brought home an old German pistol as a war trophy, which Grandma kept in her dresser drawer. She is said to have calmly pulled the pistol out of the drawer and turned and fired several shots through the window. Grandpa came running in, and she told him what happened. He and a couple of the family men grabbed their shotguns and started looking around outside. There was no blood, but there were large footprints in the soft, damp dirt near the water pump that they used for their water, and faintly muddy handprints high on both sides of the window where it had leaned against the house. Another time, there was an incident during the night of something hitting the side of the house hard enough to jar a hanging number two wash tub off a nail that held it. My father was there that night and told me about it. Also, several times they were awakened by the sound of someone or something pumping the water pump handle up and down. For a hand pump to work, it has to be primed by pouring water down the top of the pump while you pump the handle. The water being pumped acts as a lubricant that somewhat quietens the noise of the metal pump. 
Pumping a dry pump makes a quite a racket and is only done by someone that doesn't know how it works. My mother also told me some more unusual things regarding that old house. She said on some days when they would sit on the front porch at noon or in the late afternoon, there would be the sound of heavy footsteps that would come up the steps and continue across the porch and end at the bench that used to hold a water basin and soap for men to wash up for meals after coming in from the fields. These footsteps were always around noon or dinner time. People made a habit of never sitting on those steps during that time. Also, there were times when they could sit on that porch in the late afternoon and they would hear the sound of log wagons, wooden wheels and planks creaking, and trace chains rattling as they passed along the side of their house, the unseen loggers driving down a logging road long since grown up and nearly invisible for over 50 years. And then there was the time my grandmother asked my mom to go into the house and get some laundry soap which she needed as she boiled the clothes outside in a large iron pot. When my mother opened the front door, there was her Aunt May's rocking chair rocking back and forth. The house was closed up and not a breeze was blowing. Aunt May was an invalid for the last few years of her life. The family would place her rocking chair just inside the front door so she could look outside and watch the kids play or just get a breath of fresh air. She spent her time rocking and reading, and she died in her chair a few years before this incident. My mother did not go inside to get the soap, but she ran to my grandmother and told her what she saw. She and my grandmother went to look, and the chair was still rocking. My grandmother closed the door and waited until my grandfather came out of the field. She told him what happened, so he went and opened the door, but the chair was still. He went inside and brought the soap out to my grandmother. and She asked him what had happened. He told her before going into the house, he said, May, I don't mean to bother you none, but Minnie needs the soap to wash the family's clothes, so if you don't mind, I'll just take it now. So he got it, and he left. As far as I heard, there were no more chair-rocking incidents, at least any seen by the family. Now, twice a year, I still make most of that same trip we took in 1953, but now it's from my home in El Mirage, Arizona. I have a brother who farms near Oak Grove, and I visit him and another brother in Monroe who gave up farming. I am 75, and they're both older than me. US-80 still exists in bits and pieces along its old route, but now it's replaced by I-10 and I-20. Today, we can ride in comfort at 80 miles per hour through parts of New Mexico and Texas listening to satellite radio, and we can stop in comfortable hotels and motels and quench our thirst or get snacks at any of a thousand convenience stores or truck stops along the way. The house and these people are all gone now. I'm the last of my mother's side of the family from that time. My mother was the matriarch, and she died in 2000. Shortly after, so did her family reunions. None of the young people know about these stories and these people. The land is now commercially farmed. Much of the dark woods are gone, cut and cleared for timber and to make more farmland. Beulah Cemetery is still there. Now it's an island between paved roads and nearby houses. And Beef River is still there, as muddy and as slow-moving as ever. And I don't know about the booger man. I assume he moved on, trying to keep ahead of the lumber companies and the farmers. Perhaps he moved west to Falk, Arkansas. It's not that far away. Still, I like to think that on quiet evenings, just at sundown in the lonely fields west of Oak Grove, if I were to listen closely... I might hear the sound of lumber wagons long gone still squeaking and rattling down a ghostly road found now only in my memories. And he signs Tom, El Mirage, Arizona. I've done one of Tom's stories before, and this is the second one he sent me. And 
You know, they're not terribly exciting, but they're so nostalgic and well-written. I wanted to share a, a second story that he sent. And Tom, I hope you, uh, I'm going to send you an email and let you know it's going to be the, in this podcast. And I hope you're, hope you're feeling good and doing well and healthy and hope you get back to Louisiana every once in a while. All right. This email is not a story email. Sometimes I get emails in that are theories people have, and some of them are pretty interesting. And I've actually heard this theory before, but the way this man put it together, I thought it was, uh, I don't think I could explain it any better. Uh, matter of fact, I know I couldn't explain it better than he does. So I'm just going to read it to you because I think you might find it interesting. He writes, I was just listening to your recent show titled Bigfoot Horror for Native Hunters and the discussion you were having at the end of the story with your guests. I think that was one of the interviews we did with Will Jevening and Tom from, um, from their channel. I'm not sure, but I think it was, but let's move on. You asked one of the participants, and I'm paraphrasing here, why, if evidence of the existence of Bigfoot actually exists, hasn't it been acknowledged publicly? Before I retired, I encountered some information which attempted to explain why entities of the federal government are restricted from officially acknowledging the existence of Sasquatch or Bigfoot, and it relates directly to what happened with the northern spotted owl controversy here in the Pacific Northwest, which began in 1973 after the enactment of the Endangered Species Act. To make a long story short, the spotted owl became listed as potentially endangered by the U.S. Department of the Interior within vanishing Pacific Northwest old growth forests in Oregon, Washington, and eventually California. As a direct result of this declaration, vast regions of public and private forest lands once available to the timber industry were declared off limits to logging which caused absolute chaos in all three states. Lucrative timber sales were canceled, and hundreds of timber-related companies and lumber mills were shut down, and local unemployment skyrocketed as a direct result, and it has never recovered. Many formerly thriving timber towns became ghost towns, and some even disappeared entirely all because of the spotted owl and its ecosystem were declared potentially endangered due to logging of old-growth forest habitat. Now, set the way-back machine to the 1960s when the Patterson-Gimlin film began to bring public recognition to Mr. Bigfoot and dominated the Pacific Northwest forestry scene. In light of the spotted owl listing in 1973, some wildlife biologists and forestry experts began to make inferences that if the Bigfoot species actually does exist, then it is very likely even more rare and endangered than the spotted owl. Accordingly, it would be deserving of literally millions of square miles of wilderness habitat protection, in addition to the land already set aside for the spotted owl, not only the Pacific Northwest, but anywhere in the country where they're officially proven and recognized to inhabit. It was also about this time that official recognition of Bigfoot and Sasquatch became a taboo subject with the federal government, and it remains so until this day. There are mega trillions of dollars of wood products, materials, industries, and employment at stake nationwide if Bigfoot existence was ever actually proven and officially acknowledged scientifically. You can just imagine how the resulting endangered listing and subsequent setting aside of forest lands would have a negative effect on the national economy that would be absolutely devastating. Combined with the fact that Bigfoot continues to be spotted not just in the Pacific Northwest, official sighting reports and incidences are being received from just about every state in the Union, with the possible exceptions of several Midwest states and Hawaii, which do not have any appreciable forest product industries, and sightings are increasing nationwide. 
Taking the above scenario into consideration, you can then understand why the federal government would want to hush up the fact that Bigfoot exists. If they didn't, they would, in effect, be cutting their own throats monetarily, not to mention the threat of probable collapse of the national forest products industries, possibly the entire North American forest products industries as well, if Canada were to get on board, and resulting negative impact worldwide. So unfortunately, the apparent long and short of Bigfoot being recognized officially all boils down to dollar signs and politics. Follow the money and you'll find the answers as usual. Boy, that's a fact. You Man, you sure got that right. If you're going to reference this tidbit of information at some point, I'd prefer to remain anonymous if you don't mind. Thanks for listening, Cam. Have a great day and thanks for all you're doing. And he signs off. The way he writes this, I kind of tend to agree with him. I mean, you know, sometimes an explanation for something is usually the most uh, sensible and logical and simple explanation right there in front of your face. It doesn't have to be complicated. And the fact is, is if they say that Bigfoot exists and they bring forth evidence, bodies, even captured specimens, If people find out all these creatures live in the forest, it will shut down completely the uh, materials industry that goes on in the national forest. And that's a lucrative business. Thousands of people depend on that for their incomes. And I, I would have to really think about that for a long time. Is Bigfoot really that important to shut everything down? I haven't, like I said, I'd have to think about it. So don't anybody jump in my crap about that. But you need to think these things through before you come to a, a position on them. This is very informing, and I, I knew it in so many words, but the way he put it, I thought was interesting. So I thought I would share that with you. And now, and when I get some of these, you know, theory-type, non-story emails, I'm going to share some of these every once in a while, simply because I think they're interesting. And I hope you guys enjoy that, because that's the point. I want you to enjoy it as much as I do. Okay, let's go to something else. Here's one that comes from a man who doesn't exactly give us permission to use his name. So to be safe, we'll just leave him anonymous. This is what he has to say. I don't really know how true this story is, but a friend of mine and I were sitting on his front porch one day a few years back when one of the kids from down the road stopped by. The kid asked if my friend would tell the story about the Bigfoot that took him. As you might imagine, this piqued my interest. So I turned to my friend and said, Yeah, Bill, tell us that story. Bill seemed reluctant to do so, but with a little prodding, I managed to get him to tell us. This is what he said. I'm not saying it was a Bigfoot, he said. I don't really know if it was. But a long time ago, when I was a kid, about 11 years old, me and a friend were fishing down on the creek. It was getting to be time to pack up and head home, but I'd just gotten a bite, so I wanted to give it a few more casts. My friend wanted to get going, so he said he'd meet me up the trail by the road. I cast my line three more times before I decided it was time to go. From out of nowhere, I was picked up by what I took to be someone in a gorilla suit. He put me on his right shoulder like your dad would when you were little and started walking into the woods. I was not scared because I thought someone might be pulling a prank on me. I was not going to let them get the best of me, so I just enjoyed the ride and held on to his head with my left hand while he held my legs to his chest. After about 30 minutes or so of walking in the woods, I started to wonder who was doing this and where we were going. After all, it was getting dark and it didn't look like we were headed home. We rounded the corner of a hillside and suddenly there were three more, one who looked like a mom and two smaller ones, almost my size. He sat me down on the ground in a little nook formed by the hillside and some trees. It almost looked like the trees naturally fell that way, but if you really looked, you could tell that it was made to hide in. The ground was covered in the kind of grass found in a river bottom. It seemed like a nice warm place. The one who'd brought me there, that I now saw as the dad, stepped into the opening of the nook and sat down, looking out. The mom started feeding us all some berries and some kind of root. None of it was very good. 
After about an hour, everyone started to settle down and fall asleep. Relieved, I climbed out of the nook and started home in the pitch black. It took all night to find my way out of the woods. By the time I made it home, it was very late. My friend had gone and got my dad. They'd come back to look for me and found my fishing pole and tackle box. When I got home, Mom and Dad were talking with the police. There must have been about 20 men there. Some of them had dogs, and they were all getting ready to go out looking for me. When I told my dad and the policeman what had happened, the policeman looked at me and my dad and said, I believe him. No one ever asked me about it again. Not my dad, not my mom, and not the police. I'm not sure if my dad was as willing to believe me as the cop was. To this day, I'm still not sure if it was some kind of prank. I just know what happened. After my friend finished telling his story, I just looked at him and told him I believe him too. I don't know if it really is true, but he has never been one to tell lies or stretch the truth, and I've known him for 25 years. In all that time, I've only heard him tell the story two times. There were ten years between each telling, but the story didn't change. Plus, he only told it because one of his children, or the neighbor's kid, asked him about it. You all know I do uh, a Steve Lilly journal uh, series that is uh, a lot of fun to read. It's kind of crazy because one of Steve's sidekicks, actually his neighbor that lives right down the road in the trailer park from him, wrote me an email. He was telling me on the phone the other day that it looks like a lot of these people are trying to get out and hunt Bigfoot like they do. And he says that's a problem. He was telling me on the phone it was a problem. And I said, well, write me an email and show me, uh, let's explain to people what it's like to hunt a Bigfoot. He said, okay, well, I got that email today and I want to read it to you. And here's what Lewis Shanks writes. Lewis is a real smart guy. He, he may be smarter than Steve, but anyway, here's what he writes. The government, federal, state, and local is not your friend when it comes to harvesting a Bigfoot. Let's be clear. A Bigfoot corpse is worth a lot of money. But if you fail to plan your harvest, it will not be worth a dime to you. In fact, it may cost you your life savings and your freedom. It is a given that the federal government wants to cover up the existence of Bigfoot. Let's say you kill a Bigfoot and then cruise into town with a corpse in the bed of your pickup truck. You start showing off your trophy. The government will be there almost immediately. That's a fact. First, there will be local authorities, then they will contact the feds, and then 10 different federal agencies will show up demanding that you turn over the body. And at this point, you're really screwed. If you lose the body, then you lose the fortune. If you say no to giving the body to the feds, then they will seize it by force. And if you have it and fail to give its location, then they will charge you with obstruction of justice obstructing an investigation, and killing and concealing an illegally taken animal, and whatever else they can dream up. Then, if they find enough DNA that matches human DNA, they're going to charge you with murder. Now, many of these threats are actual criminal charges. Levied against you will be frivolous bullshit. But it will not matter. All that matters to the feds is that they take possession of that body. By the time you go to court and get the trumped up charges dismissed, the body will be long gone. They will have it. And further, they will release a bogus scientific data alleging that the animal was a bear or a dog or something, anything. You will not get off scot-free, though. They will charge you for harvesting and being in possession of an illegal animal for which there is no open season. They will also get you on obstruction. And what's worse is that you will be up against the Department of Justice and they have unlimited resources. You will bankrupt your finances on legal fees. The government knows this. This is how they're going to squeeze you to keep you quiet. You will be forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement and then pay a huge fine and then serve the next 10 years in prison or on probation so they can keep up with you. If you don't keep your mouth shut, they're going to produce bogus DNA and say you murdered a human. 
Imagine how crazy you will sound in court testifying that you shot and killed a Bigfoot while the medical examiner testifies the subject was in a very decomposed state when it arrived, but DNA testing reveals that the deceased was in fact a human. There will be a grain of truth to that, but that is it. And if you insist you shot a hairy Bigfoot, then the jury will think you're nuts and lock you up for life. Obviously, there are ways around this. In these circumstances, this means that when you kill a Bigfoot, you got to keep it a secret. Allow for verification and documentation by a qualified person. Document everything by video, too. But do not allow the public to have access to either the body or you. Communicate with the outside world through a trusted attorney. It would even be a good idea for both you and the corpse to leave the country for a bit. You will be responsible for preserving the body. And remember, document everything. My approach would be to give favorable treatment to an offer from an American so that you can tie immunity to the agreement. Plus, with the discovery out into the open and the feds cannot cover it up, this will enable you to monetize the experience to its fullest extent. An agreement to be free to do this will also be struck as a condition of turnover. Another possibility is to cut a deal with the foreign government. You must be prepared for this. You may have to live in exile, but such will be the price for your fortune. The most important things to remember is that you absolutely must maintain possession of the body and have secure means to communicate to your agents, your attorneys, working for you on the outside while you are underground with the corpse. I don't know a soul who would go through all this trouble to make any kind of money, but this is how you'll have to do it. These are things to consider if you are serious about killing a Sasquatch. You will have to play hardball with the government. Thus the need to take security measures in order to maintain a level playing field where you are beyond the reach of their hardball tactics. As should be apparent, killing a Bigfoot is just the first step. If you're going to collect the prize, then you must have a plan. It will be a long and treacherous few years. Steve Lilly, Hook Johnson, and me, Lewis Shanks, we don't have this problem. We are sanctioned and paid to kill these things, and business was good until they screwed us over. Cam, read this to your audience. Make sure they know there's a big price to pay killing a Bigfoot. All right, Lewis, there you go, brother. I just read it to everybody, and I hope anybody out there that's actually planning on killing one of these things Think twice about it, because you're about to go down a road that is never ending. But the main thing is to have a plan, and the plan could take many years. And I'm like Lewis. I don't know many people willing to give up their lives to kill a Bigfoot and get paid for it. It's good words from Lewis Shanks. Thanks, Lewis. Thank you for following along on this podcast. I really appreciate you. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you. Hope you guys have a great weekend, and we'll see you on the next podcast. Thank you.